Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. This week I researched a case suggested to us by fellow viewer D. We're going to be discussing the exploitation and torture of Buddy Musso. I ask you all to join me as we remember Buddy. Louis Charles Musso, known as Buddy to his friends, was born on March 26, 1939 in Manhattan, New York. Buddy was a mentally handicapped man who had the intellect of an eight-year-old. Despite this, he did live independently in an assisted living facility in Cliffside, New Jersey. He worked full-time as a bagger at the ShopRite, a local grocery store. Many stated Buddy had aspirations of being a country singer and often made everyone smile with his off-key renditions of country hits. Buddy was not close to family, besides his niece. But he did have several good friends who cared for Buddy, and everyone in his facility adored him. Buddy was married once, and together the two had a son, but sadly his wife passed away in 1980 from cancer. He was described as being a sweet person and a hopeless romantic. If anyone showed Buddy attention, he became attached, because he just wanted love. In July of 1997, Buddy's love would come he attended a church bazaar where he met a woman more than 10 years his junior, Suzanne Basso. Suzanne and Buddy hit it off well. The problem? Suzanne was not local to the area. She was from Texas and only visiting for a few days with friends. The two decided to stay in touch, pursuing a long-distance relationship, mostly through love letters and long phone calls. Buddy was smitten with Suzanne. He called her every single night and told friends all about his lady love. But for Suzanne, the distance was too much, and she proposed to Buddy to move to Texas so the two could eventually marry and have a family of their own. Buddy loved this idea and started putting the plan in motion, saving money for a ring and a ticket to Texas. He started slowly shipping his possessions to Suzanne's home, and by June of 1998, he was ready to start his new life. Buddy bought himself a new cowboy hat and boots before boarding a Greyhound bus, headed to Jacinto City, Texas, leaving behind his entire support system. Little did Buddy know, Suzanne Basso was nothing close to what she promised him. Suzanne Basso was born in Schenectady, New York on May 15, 1954. She was one of eight children, but the youngest of the girls. Growing up, her parents were alcoholics and subjected Suzanne and her siblings to various forms of abuse. She became a troubled teen experimenting with drugs, but managed to graduate high school. During the early 1970s, she married her husband, James Peak, a Marine. Together, they had two children, a daughter, Christiana, in 1973, and a son, James, the following year. Suzanne was very promiscuous despite being married. When her husband learned of her extramarital affairs, he was fine with her behaviors. She often took her young children on her dates, leaving them unattended while she was intimate with a stranger in the next room. The Peak family moved around. In 1982, her husband was arrested for assaulting their daughter. He was convicted of indecent liberties with a child. Her children came out later as adults, describing the abuse as a constant cycle throughout their childhood from both of their parents. Suzanne lost her children to foster care after her husband was imprisoned. They were eventually given to family members to care for. In the early 1990s, the Peak family were reunited. James was released and Suzanne regained custody. It was around this time that Suzanne became obsessed with the Irish culture and changing the family name from Peak to O'Malley as a fresh start for them all but a new name did not bring new behaviors per her children. A procession of strangers were moved in and out of their home. As her son James grew older, Suzanne had a strange relationship with him. She would force him to shoplift or beg for change. She also made him eat off the floor and often locked him inside of the home, where he was not permitted to leave. By the time they became teenagers, her children tried to make complaints to social services of their mother's behavior, but no one intervened. Three years after bringing the family back together, Suzanne found a new romantic partner. Carmine Basso owned and worked at the Houston security firm. 
Suzanne sometimes worked security for apartments, and their paths crossed. Suzanne quickly moved Carmine into the same home as her family, with Carmine eventually replacing James, who moved out months after his arrival. Since Suzanne did not file for a divorce from James, she could not officially marry Carmine. Despite this, however, she introduced Carmine to friends as her husband and took his last name. In 1997, a trip was planned to New Jersey where Suzanne planned to meet Carmine's family. But it was during this trip she met Buddy Musso. Oddly, during this trip to New Jersey, Carmine was found dead in his office at the security firm. His autopsy revealed no foul play and stated his cause of death was due to natural causes from a pre-existing condition. Suzanne's friends stated she was still in Houston at the time of his death, despite her claiming to be out of town. When Buddy arrived to Texas, he had no idea who Suzanne was or the life she led. He arrived at her home, which was anything like the charming life she had painted for him. Suzanne lived with her son, James O'Malley, who was 24 at the time. Almost immediately after he moved in, Buddy started a life of servitude, where Suzanne forced him to do the grunt work. With Buddy in her grasp, Suzanne started to make moves to become his benefactor for his social security benefits claiming to be his bride-to-be, but she was denied. Unknown to her, Buddy had a longtime friend, Al Becker, who was responsible for helping Buddy with his finances. Al noticed things felt off shortly after Buddy left. At first, he was able to contact him, but over time, it became increasingly more difficult. He would eventually only talk to Suzanne, who claimed Buddy didn't want to talk to him. Al became concerned and sought assistance from agencies in Texas to help his friend out, but this got him nowhere. And as time passed, no one from back home heard from Buddy. In August of 1999, Suzanne started to call everyone she could to let them know she thought Buddy ran away, and she was concerned. She called his niece, her friends, and eventually the police to file a report. She explained that Buddy left her home and she wasn't completely sure where he had gone. She told everyone it was possible that Buddy ran off with a little Hispanic lady he met at the nearby laundromat, and she was just really worried. But the horrific truth would soon be uncovered. On August 28, 1998, a jogger in Galena Park was running the trails early in the morning when they noticed a misshapen lump in a ditch. They stepped closer and noticed the shape was a human body and called police immediately. Police arrived at the scene and noticed extensive damage to the victim. The body possessed no identification. It was cleaned up and redressed in fresh clothes. The victim had their right shoe on their left foot and the right foot was shoeless. Based on the injuries seen, police determined the victim likely died from blunt force trauma and was killed at a separate location before being left in the ditch. The investigator on the case called the dispatcher to see if anyone had been reported missing, and there was, 59-year-old Buddy Musso. Believing the two could be connected, the investigator retrieved the information of Suzanne Basso, who reported him missing. He arrived at the address listed on the report, where contact with Suzanne was made. She was asked to come help identify the body, and Suzanne agreed, bringing her son James along with her. When they arrived at the scene, Suzanne was hysterical, so investigators brought James near the body and asked if that was Buddy. James said, yeah, that's him. They then asked if he had any idea what happened to him, and James replied, yeah, we killed him. We did not only include James and his mother, however, but four other people. Suzanne's friend, Bernice Ahrens Miller, aged 55, her son, Craig Ahrens, aged 25, her daughter, Hope Ahrens, aged 22, and Hope's fiancé, Terrence Singleton, aged 28. Each person single-handedly played some role in what would later be revealed as a three- or four-day-long torture session that Buddy endured. After James' confession, Buddy's body was transported to the coroner for an autopsy. The report detailed a long list of cuts, mutilations, fractures, a broken nose, and black eyes. On his head were a total of 17 cuts and a large X-shaped laceration. They couldn't even begin to count the hundreds of bruises that covered him from head to toe. His back and bottom had lashing marks indicating he was whipped. He suffered 14 broken ribs and two dislocated vertebrae. 
Along his abdomen and back were over 30 cigarette burns and abrasions attributed to a chemical burn or being scrubbed with something. Ultimately, Buddy died from a skull fracture which was caused by an unknown object. James and Suzanne were brought in for additional questioning after James confessed to the murder. Suzanne denied having any involvement with Buddy's death, but James was an open book. During interrogation, James explained days before Buddy died, Suzanne moved James and Buddy into the apartment of fellow accomplice Bernice Ahrens Miller due to a broken pipe at their home. Already living in the apartment was Bernice, her two children, and Hope's fiance. Suzanne made Buddy kneel naked on a children's playmat out of sight and was denied food and water. He cried frequently and was beaten in retaliation. Buddy was also denied access to the toilet, which resulted in accidents, which only made his captors more violent. Every single one of the occupants took turns hitting Buddy for their own reasons. But James claimed on the evening of August 25th, Buddy broke a Mickey Mouse figurine and Suzanne had enough. James dunked Buddy four or five times in a bathtub full of a cleaning solution, such as Pine Saw. While still in the bathtub, he poured alcohol all over his head before scrubbing his body with a wire brush. Suzanne then hit Buddy in the back of the head, which ultimately killed him. She ordered James, Terrence, and Craig to redress Buddy, put him in the trunk of the car, and leave his body in the ditch. To prove his claims, James led police to the dumpster where they discarded Buddy's bloody clothes, a bloodstained towel, a mat, and rubber gloves. A search warrant was served on Suzanne's home, and a motive became clear. While searching the very cluttered house, a life insurance policy for Buddy Musso was found in the amount of $15,000. In the event of a violent death, the policy had a clause which boosted the benefit to $60,000. A will was found and signed by Buddy. The witnesses listed on the document were Suzanne and three of her co-defendants, which named Suzanne the sole heir to Buddy's property. A restraining order was also created barring any of Buddy's relatives to contact him. Bank statements and canceled checks were also discovered, which indicated Buddy was signing over his social security payments to Suzanne. A search of the computer in the home revealed the original will which was created 12 days before Buddy was murdered. A pair of Buddy's pants revealed that Buddy was cognizant of his fate in the final weeks. A handwritten letter was found in the pocket addressed to his friend, which stated, you must get someone down here and get me out of here. I want to come back to New Jersey soon. The note also asked his friend to contact his niece for money so he could buy a bus ticket home. It was later discovered Buddy was denied help twice. While searching the home, nearby neighbors were questioned about Buddy, and one claimed he often saw Buddy bruised, but he denied his help. The neighbor Bruce told police he saw Buddy with a black eye and wounds about a week before his body was found. Bruce asked if he needed an ambulance or police, but he replied, no, you call someone, she will just beat me up again. Then on August 22nd, Officer Butcher was called to a possible assault and found three men in a field near Bernice's apartment. The three men were James, Terrence, and Buddy. The two were leading Buddy on a military-style run. Buddy had two black eyes and complained that he didn't want to keep running. When the officer arrived, he questioned Buddy about his black eye, but he claimed he was beaten up days ago by a group of men and denied any medical treatment. The officer didn't push on and drove the three men back to Bernice's apartment, where Buddy was returned to Suzanne. Although skeptical of the situation, the officer left. Buddy died just days later. After James's confession, all six suspects were brought into the police station and eventually charged with murder. During each individual interrogation, everyone pointed the finger at each other. But one thing all five of the suspects seemed to agree on was that Suzanne was the ringleader. The Texas district judge decided that most of the six suspects would be tried separately, with James O'Malley being the first on April 13, 1999. During his trial, James testified he felt pressured by his mother to take part in the abuse, and he was scared of her. James admitted to the abuse he inflicted on Buddy, including kicking him with steel-toed boots. Craig Ahrens went on trial later the same month, and his mother and Terrence went on trial in May. 
Craig and Bernice admitted in their written confessions, which were read to the jury, that they participated in hitting Buddy on several occasions, but ultimately blamed Suzanne for killing Buddy. The jury found both Craig and Bernice guilty of murder and sentenced Bernice to 80 years in prison while Craig got 60 years in prison. During his trial, Terrence admitted to kicking Buddy and hitting him with a bat. His confession was also read to the jury where he implicated Suzanne and James as the most culpable, stating the final blows came from Suzanne herself. Terrence stated Buddy was responsive when everyone else hit him. The jury found Terrence guilty of murder and sentenced him to life in prison. Hope was tried in June. During her confession, she also blamed Suzanne and James for killing Buddy. She explained the figurine broken was hers, and Buddy claimed to want her and her mother dead. So in response, she hit him with a wooden bird, but not that hard. Her trial ended in a hung jury, where prosecution took this as an opportunity. They offered Hope a plea bargain in exchange for her testimony against Suzanne. If she agreed to testify, she would only serve 20 years for her involvement. So, Hope took the deal. Suzanne's trial started in July. Upon entering the courtroom, Suzanne insisted on using a wheelchair, claiming she had developed paralysis, mental health problems, chest pains, and stomach pains. She'd lost about 210 pounds and seemed to regress to a childlike state, speaking in a squeaky little girl voice. However, a court-ordered psychiatrist claimed Suzanne was faking many of these conditions, and a competency trial was held where she was found capable of facing the jury. During her time in court, she was unkempt and appeared to not be paying attention. Her original confession was read where Suzanne claimed she only hit Buddy with a belt one time and she tried to push the blame on the other five involved. She did admit to driving the car to dispose of Buddy and the evidence, but claimed to have no additional part in the murder. Then Hope was brought to the witness stand. Hope testified that on several occasions she saw Suzanne hit Buddy with various objects, including a vacuum attachment, a belt, etc. She also jumped up and down on him and encouraged her son to kick him. With Hope's testimony, the jury found Suzanne guilty of murder. During the sentencing phase, her daughter was placed on the stand to recount her miserable childhood. Even though the defense stated Suzanne would not be a future threat to society, the jurors were unmoved. After six hours of deliberation, Suzanne was given the death penalty. Six weeks after Suzanne's conviction, Hope pled guilty to her involvement and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Suzanne was imprisoned at Mountain View Unit Prison in Gatesville until her sentence could be carried out. Suzanne attempted several appeals to overturn her sentence, but all were rejected. On February 6, 2014, Suzanne was put to death by lethal injection. She provided no final statement, but appeared to be holding back tears before smiling at two friends through the window. She was pronounced dead at 6.26 p.m. As of 2015, James O'Malley is serving his sentence at the Jerry H. Hodge Unit in Rusk, Texas. Bernice Ahrens is serving her sentence at the William P. Hobby Unit in Falls County, Texas. Craig Ahrens and Terrence Singleton are serving their sentences at the Jim Ferguson Unit in Madison County, Texas. Hope Ahrens has since been released. The remaining offenders will be eligible for parole hearings starting in 2038 except for Craig Ahrens, who will be eligible in 2028. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Thank you again to Dee for sharing this tragic case with all of us here. As always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them below and we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more videos from me. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you all my friends for your love and support to this channel and to me. As you can tell, I've recovered nicely from my wisdom teeth removal and I can't thank you all enough for your well wishes and tips and tricks that everyone sent me. You are awesome. I hope each and every one of you has a great week ahead of you. But for now, stay safe out there and I will see you all in the next one. Bye friends.